Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Coinsign. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. If you're new to our podcast, I encourage you to go back and listen to some of our previous episodes. We've had some great uh, leaders that have joined us and uh, they share some life lessons and leadership lessons that they've learned. This week, we're happy to have join us Daryl Johnson. Daryl is the uh, Chief Strategy Officer for RL Datrix a global SaaS healthcare company. Uh, He was previously the uh, chief marketing officer at Cerner, and uh, he's also held positions as an executive in companies such as Medtronic and GE Healthcare. Looking forward to today's conversation with Daryl. Well, I guess first off, can you give us just a little bit of your your career story, a little bit of your, uh, your history? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to go into a lot of detail here, but uh, I would say what drives me every single day and what I'm passionate about, uh, which um, is a very hard problem to solve, is how to improve outcomes in healthcare. Uh, and outcomes is a broad definition, um, but I think it's too expensive uh, and um, it's complicated. It's too hard for our clinicians. Uh, and I just think that there's ways that we can use technology to make it a lot better. So I've been on a personal journey for the last 25 years to figure out how to use uh, and leverage data infrastructures in healthcare. So I did that for uh, in the early, so 2000 to 2007, worked for GE Healthcare, doing it in hospital. Um, then I went to Medtronic uh, and really built out an external uh, patient uh, system uh, to communicate with implantable devices. Um, and then I went to Cerner uh, and really was uh, uh, fascinated around pop health and, and trying to build the medical home of the future and seeing how we can connect uh, data uh, while people are living in their homes uh, to the into the clinical environment. And then um, left there. And now I work for a company called RL Datex, where we're using a SaaS-based uh, software to really capture at a longitudinal, holistic level, data to improve quality, safety, and risk. And so uh, I think the biggest thing there is, um, boy, in today's environment, when we don't have enough doctors and nurses, is there anything that we can do to improve outcomes and improve uh, the, uh, take time away from the physicians and the nurses on a lot of administrative tasks that they're doing so they can spend more time with patients uh, and improve outcomes. So that's where I'm at today. Right. Well, if you were uh, able to go back and, and talk to a 22-year-old Daryl as you were getting out in the world of uh, work, uh, knowing what you know now, what what advice would you give him? That's a great question, Mark. Um, 22 years ago seems like a long time ago. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, I think that uh, for the most part, um, 22-year-olds uh, and my even myself, uh, I know that um, the people have referred to it as, you know, playing the political game inside organizations. And I think going back to myself uh, in that in that time frame, um, it's not so much about political um, and you know knowing who you can talk to and not, who not to talk to. It's really influencing inside the organization. And I would have gone back uh, when I was my younger self and figured out how to influence. Um, individuals to uh, ensure that we're prioritizing and aligned on solving the problem. And I think influencing is not the same as politics. It, they're, they're totally different. Influencing is um, getting people uh, aligned with the problem you're trying to solve. And most, most importantly, and most critical, is it important to solve? Is it a priority for the organization? And I think um, back in the day, I remember working on things um, and then talking to people about what I was working on. And I could feel that there was a misalignment, that the stuff I was working on wasn't the most important things to work on. So I'd go back and I would really work on influencing and aligning uh, my work to what's the most important in the organization so that we can uh, make an impact um, faster uh, and and, uh, minimize a lot of the inefficiencies across the organization. 
So thinking back to that first leadership role that you had uh, early on in, in your career, um, what what do you wish you would have done sooner or differently uh, than what you, you did and, and what lessons did you learn uh, from that experience? Another great question. Um, well, I've worked for some really big companies, um, all, you know, General Electric, uh, G Healthcare, you know, large company, uh, Medtronic, uh, even at the time when I left, it was $30 billion, 90,000 employees, Cerner, five and a half billion, all the top 100, Fortune 100, and Fortune 500 companies. And, um, you know, I look back at it and uh, I think what I would have, um, in my first leadership role, I would have made sure that uh, I said no more often, uh, took stuff off the plate. Uh, I think there's just this this common, you know, tendency that if somebody asks for something, you just put it on your plate and you do it. And I think as a leader, um, it's it's my responsibility. And protect's not the right word, Mark, but you want to make sure that your team is set up for success. And I understand that there's times where you got to burn the candle on both ends and you might be pulling in some 60-hour weeks. But boy, if you do that for a long time, you lose um, your team and your team gets burnt out. And so uh, as a leader, I would have gone back and I would have made sure I said no more often. Or if it was a yes, it had to be a yes. What could I take off the plate and protected the team for success? to be set up for success and not burn them out. Um, because I think at the end of the day, when you just keep on saying yes and adding it to the plate, um, then you kind of create um, kind of a chaoticness in the organization. And I just think as a leader, I wish I would have learned that earlier because um, now I push back a lot more and uh, we do the most important stuff. And if something's more important, we'll take something off the plate and do something else. We'll be that, at, we'll work in an agile mode um, but I don't just automatically add stuff to the plate um, like I did in the in the past. So you you talk about alignment uh, in in focus. What what are some things that you've uh, learned about kind of keeping the team aligned and focused on the right things? You mentioned as far as just making sure that you're you're uh, looking at what are the top objectives or things that you should be looking at. It's really interesting um, because I'm an outside in person. What I mean by that is I, I'm a really simple business person. I go out and talk to customers and I ask them what their problems are. Um, and then I try to figure out, uh, is it worthwhile to solve that problem? What's our right to win if we solve that problem? What value we're creating, et cetera. So internally, I love to ask my team uh, when, when we're in a meeting or not even my team, if my boss's team, I report to the CEO. Um, and I've reported to CEOs for, for many years, but I'm shocked um, how many times I will go into a room and I will ask somebody, what do you think the number one project is or the number one problem we should be working on to solve? And how often you get 10 different answers. Mm -hmm. And when you get 10 different answers, five different answers, whatever it is, you're going to have chaos. Um and I love it when we're all aligned and literally we put up a slide and we say, here's the five things we're working on. This is the number one thing that we must deliver on. And when everybody's aligned on that number one thing, including the CEO of the company, that is a good place to be. Um, uh, and so I really, really strive to make sure that I ask everybody. And then here's the other thing that's, that's most important about that, Mark, is that there's two other components of that. You've got to tell people why it's the number one thing that you're working on that. And number two, how their role in the organization is important for us to deliver against what we're trying to deliver. Because everybody wants to be connected to purpose. Everybody wants to be connected to impact. And they want to know what are we working on? Why is it important? And what's my role in, in, in solving that? And if you get all of that alignment um, and you deliver and execute with in, incredible transparency, uh, in communication, it's a good place to be. So you've been in some very large uh, organizations, um, and every organization has a culture, uh, but also the culture is impacted by the leader within a, a smaller group uh, within that company. Uh, how did you, and I'm sure there are times that you came into a situation where you inherited a team and maybe the culture of that team wasn't healthy. What are some things that you've done as far as to maybe change culture or to, to help improve it? 
Um, yes, to, to answer, I mean, I have been in a lot of different cultures and a lot of cultures that have been derived from a bunch of different uh, through acquisitions, uh, uh, mainly um, where you're acquiring a bunch of different cultures. You know, as they always say, culture starts at the top, um, and it's really important. Um, I can tell you, I have three kids, uh, Mark, and um, my uh, 30-year-old, my 28-year-old, and my 26-year-old. And they're not who they are because of what I said. They are who they are because of what I did and what they watched me do. Um, and I think as a leader, uh, you can sit out there and you can say all the things that uh, a leader read out of the latest book. And they said, this is what you need to do to be an effective leader. But if you don't do it, it um, doesn't matter. Uh, so... Uh, I think what I try to do is I try to point out to um, within the leaders of the organization, my peers within HR, how we might have um, incongruency between walk and talk. Uh, because if there's incongruency, your culture is going to be um, kind of a big mess. And you'll see in every company, you'll see your value statements and your you know, they'll be posted on the walls and here's our values and here's our behaviors and all that type of stuff doesn't matter if you don't walk them and you don't actually exhibit them. Um, it's, I mean, it, it's not going to go well. So I think from my perspective, um, what I do try to do culturally is I try to make sure that uh, people understand the purpose of our company externally. What are we trying to do to drive value, to improve something that gives us purpose? And then internally, I try to make sure that everybody feels a part of the team and they're contributing to the greater purpose of what we're trying to deliver to our customers. Um, that to me is, is number one. Number two is I want to have fun in the organization. I'm a huge believer in uh, driving a, a sense of cultural fun within the organization. We all spend 40 hours a week, 50 hours a week together. You got to have a little fun along the way um, because if you don't, then it just is... Um, it just becomes uh, a hard place to show up every single day if you feel like you're grinding everything out and you're not building building the team. And then the third thing is, is that people want to come to an organization and they want to feel like there's a path for them to develop their career. And uh, culturally, I want to make sure people feel like, whether it's in my organization or outside of my organization, I want to make sure I understand what are people's aspirations, um, where do they want to go in their career, and then I figure out how I can connect them throughout the organization. If they want to be in marketing, fine, we'll get them in marketing. If they want to be in strategy, fine, we'll figure out how to be in strategy. If they want to be in sales, we can figure out how to get them in sales. But you got to take uh, uh, some time to really connect with people to help them develop their career and then connect them in the organization so they feel they have the best career possible uh, in the organization. I think if you can do those things within your organization, you're going to culturally multiply and have a successful organization where people will want to stay and work uh, within your organization. I know you've been responsible for marketing uh, at a high level within uh, within organizations, and I think there's a misconception by leaders is what, what is marketing? You know what what is it, how does it fit within the overall strategy of the the organization? Can you talk a little bit about that? I think you had mentioned uh, in a previous conversation that there are, I think it's just four questions that you look at as far as as you're you're looking at marketing and how you connect it to the overall vision. Yeah, there's. I personally believe there's a huge disconnect, um, and and a lot of. Um, I, I was a chief marketing officer for for Cerner, and um, I think the a lot of times the, the marketing circles, they they talk a lot about uh, your digital footprints, and they talk about your brand, they talk about how you do campaigns and lead generation and value messaging and all that type of you know your events. Uh, which all of that stuff is is really important. Um, but I think uh, uh, there's another half of the equation that I think a lot of people forget about. And I'm an end-to-end marketer. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, I always, always consider what the four questions you're talking about. I always consider what problem are we solving for our customer? Uh, that's always the very first question. If you can't articulate uh, as a company why you exist and what your value proposition and what problem or what value you're bringing to your customers, you got a big problem. And I don't care what kind of marketing you do from a brand perspective and a messaging perspective. That's like the basic of the basic of the basic. Um, and you'd be amazed how many times I sit in a room and I'll listen to a presentation and 20 minutes in, I'll raise my hand and I'll say, I don't understand what problem we're solving for the customer. 
And you would have think you would think that I would ask people to solve the Rubik's cube and put all the colors aligned within 10 seconds because they look at me like I ask them a really complicated question, but it's a really easy question. So what problem are you solving? The second thing that follows that, which is really, really important, what is our right to win to solve that problem? And again, I've been in, in organizations, I've been with board of directors, I've been in a lot of very high level meetings, and I will see slides where uh, we think, we, we thought that it was our right to win against multiple, multiple billion dollar companies uh, that had you know massive market share in a space. And it just wasn't going to be reality for us to win in that space. So what problem are we solving? What's our right to win? Um, third is, can we measure the value that we're going to create for the customer when we solve the problem? You need to have that because that's at the end of the day, especially in healthcare, you have to speak value because they don't have any money. So if you don't speak value and what dollars you're going to create for them, um, you're not going to necessarily get in the boardroom. That's a necessity. And then the last one, which has become more prevalent, I would say, in the last 10 years, and Jeff Bezos is, is phenomenal at this, uh, Steve Jobs was phenomenal at this, is what experience are you going to create for your customers uh, when they interact with your brand? And the experience isn't just with the product. The experience is in every any interaction that they have with your, your tech support, your education, your training, your implementation, how they use the product. Um, your quoting process, your invoicing uh, process. It's, it's all the things that come in to give you that experience. Those are the four questions that I ask on a regular basis. And there's no way you can be a successful marketer if you don't look at that end to end. Um, because yeah, fine, do the value messaging. But until you go all the way upstream before you invest one nickel in innovation and your R&D, you better answer those four questions mm-hmm to prepare you to go to market so you can be an uh, an effective marketer. So you've uh, you've probably read a number of business books and there's always seems to be new trends or new new concepts that are out there. But uh, are there any books that you recommend to other leaders that you feel like have some timeless advice or uh, something that would be helpful for somebody that's kind of a newer up and coming leader? You know, it's funny that um, that you asked, and the reason I was chuckling is that um, there's so many times in my career where I thought a book was like a really great book, and then I'll pass it on to somebody, and I'll, I'll ask them what they thought about it, and they didn't nearly get the same reaction that I had when I read the book. So sure. it's kind of like when you go to a movie, I'm sure this happens to you, Mark, and somebody will say, hey, you got to go see this movie, or even on Netflix, you got to watch this series, um, and I'll start watching it, and I just like, I can't get through it. I don't like it. So... Um, so I think that's a, a very personal question, um, but I would say that um, what I think that this world is really void of is phenomenal leaders. Um, and I would say that if anybody can pick up some, continue to pick up leadership books, John Maxwell uh, has phenomenal books. I mean, I, I will you know read all of his uh, of his books, um, but uh, I, I love reading leadership books. I love watching uh, TED talks, uh, and as a leader, it's it's, it is about what we've talked about before. It's about influencing and aligning and connecting with people in a way where uh, you can do things um, as a team more effectively uh, versus an individual. I mean, that's the power of leadership. And I just unfortunately see, and I'm sure you see this, Mark, and I'm sure your listeners see this, that there's this big void of effective leaders, um, which is just, it's too bad. Um, so I would say that for the listeners of this podcast, go out there and read some John Maxwell books, go out there and read some leadership books, um, and watch some Ted talks. Uh, they're only 15 minutes long. Try to figure out how you can influence, uh, in the organization and get people to listen to you, um, and do it in a way that impacts, um, the effectiveness, not only of you, but of your team, um, because that to me is uh, really one of the really critical voids uh, right now in business. So you've been managing and you know, everybody that wasn't using Zoom or uh, wasn't on it prior to COVID have, 
found that a lot of their meetings are taking place this way, kind of through through uh, the technology. Uh, how have you kept your team? And you've got a team that's spread out all over the place and uh, in different time zones. Uh, but how have you kept your team together, even those that have been working virtually? Is there anything that you've discovered that's been helpful as far as just to keep everybody again going back to that alignment, uh, working virtually? Yeah, I think, um, you know, going into the office, um, you know, and seeing people, you know, physically face to face, there's just the, uh, the opportunity to do chit chat, you know, and just connect. Um, and I don't care what it is, you know, if, 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 you know, here in Minnesota, you're talking about the Minnesota wild, I've been I'm a big hockey fan. So I like talking about hockey or, you know, you can, it's a beautiful day. Hey, did you go golfing this weekend or something like that? Um, and for whatever reason on the zoom side, um, it's so intimidating to have those types of conversations because all of a sudden you get on a screen and there's seven people staring at you and all of a sudden everybody kind of, we lose that social connected tissue right. because it feels like there's 14 eyeballs staring at you. And it feels like, you know, versus a one-on-one kind of just off on the side talking about somebody's, you know, um, you know, child's, you know, uh, you know, football game or hockey game or, or something that was going on in there. You can do that on a side-by-side versus seven people, you know, in this zoom call. So I have found that um, you got to still do it. You got to have fun. You got to laugh. You got to tell some jokes. You got to be able to connect with people and take those first few minutes to do it. Even when it feels really awkward that you have all these people staring at you. Um, Because again, we spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week with each other. uh, And and there's more important things than P&Ls inside business. Um, There's, you know, there's families and families that have, uh, you know, I've known people that have lost loved ones in, in, during COVID and people that have had some tragedies in their lives and pre- a lot of, lot of unfortunate things going on. And um, you got to support each other through some of this tough times. And if you kind of blow over that and go right into the Zoom meeting and you miss all that stuff, then then it's um, you have a risk of losing that connectedness of your team. The other thing, too, that we started doing, um, which I... Um, thought was kind of fun is, you know, once a month, just rather than have a meeting, do a 4.30 in the afternoon social hour and have people get on a Zoom call and rather than doing a meeting, just get on there and, you know, have everybody have a cocktail or, you know, a soda or something like that and just um, socialize with people and just get together for 15 minutes, 30 minutes and wish each other, you know, a great weekend um, and and do that once in a while too, just to have a little bit of fun. Um, But uh, I would, we just got to be a little more creative in a world that's going to be hybrid and virtual uh, versus, you know, always coming to the office. So outside of work, what do you do to, to recharge? You mentioned hockey, you're a hockey fan. Anything hockey fan. Uh, yeah. I mean, I like, um, so uh, do, I do a lot of outdoor stuff. I like to hike um, uh, right before COVID my daughter and I did hiked up Kilimanjaro. So that was fun. Mm-hmm. Um uh, it's, it's, it's different hiking up a mountain. Um, and that was almost 20,000 feet. So we had the, uh, uh, you know, the, the oxygen, uh, depletion was certainly a point, uh, that came into play, uh, for that, that I, I did, uh, the Inca trail down to, down to Machu Picchu. That was a pretty cool hike. Um, my wife and I were just down in, in, in Southern France and went up, up Mount Ventoux. Um, uh, that's a smaller mountain, but I like getting outdoors um, like to do some kayaking and some paddle boarding and uh, some golf and, you know, anything I can do to, to spend some time outside, uh, particularly with family would be great. Um, uh, I do do a lot of reading. Um, I'm, I'm probably, uh, a little bit on the nerdiest side when it, when it comes to, you know, uh, being a, a music fan or, a you know, kind of a, you know, a Netflix series fan. I, I tend not to do more of that, but do more reading. Um, but, um, uh, but those are the things I, I tend to enjoy. So, uh, what parting advice would you give to uh, a new leader? Is they're uh, they're making their way? What uh, what would you tell them? Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, um, I want I, I would love it if people recognize the difference between leadership and management. Mm-hmm. Um, they're two different things. And I think that uh, I've managed a lot of people and I've led a lot of people. And I always tell people that um, 
I will hire great leaders that have never managed people um, when I have when I want them to lead the organization through something. Um, I don't necessarily take uh, a manager and ask them to be a leader. Uh, they're they're two different things. So from my perspective, um, uh, just understand for for a leader, if you really truly want to be a leader, it's about empowering people and getting the best out of your team with a lot of clarity and a lot of alignment. Uh, to uh, to go and tackle uh, a common cause with purpose. Um, management is a different, it's an important skill, but it's a different skill. Uh, I think that there's too many people who don't know the difference between the two. Um, so I would say for the, for the listeners, um, go out there and, and, and find uh, some books on some of the best leaders out there and read up what makes them good leaders. You'd be a little surprised on, on what makes them a good leader, um, because a lot of it's really common sense. Um, it's not overly complicated. complicated. Um, so that would be my advice is no difference between the two, leadership and management. They're obviously both important. Um, but uh, I think the world needs more uh, really great leaders. And, um, and if you really want to make an impact in uh, your organization, try to be the best leader as possible. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Daryl. Enjoyed uh, our conversation. I know this is going to be helpful for uh, the people that are listening and wish you continued uh, success in all you're doing. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.